Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a simulation of a nuclear blast in a major city by Neil Haloran. This one was recommended to me by someone who watched my Kurtzgazat video called What Happens If We Nuke a City? I'll put a link for that one on the screen. This one's supposed to be a bit different though. Uh, they used a different type of weapon and they also, I believe, talked about um, hypersonic weapons, at least is what this, uh, this person told me. So let's check it out. Imagine for a moment the unimaginable happened. A major city is hit by a nuclear weapon. Now, no number could account for all the devastation that would result. But we can put a number on the deaths. At least we can make an educated guess based on our understanding of what... This is a really cool looking model thing, by the way. Okay, so they said it's four million people. ...clear blast due to city structures and people. We'll assume the bomb is detonated in the air to maximize the radius of impact. So, uh, air burst detonations, uh, this one's about 500 meters, which is about typical. They could be anywhere from like 100 meters to 1,000 meters or so. And as they said, yes, the idea is to maximize the overall destruction at this particular altitude. The crazy weapon that was 50 megatons, that was a crazy propaganda weapon called Sarbama, was at... 4,000 meters above to give you a sense of how crazy of a device that was at. But yeah, this number is, uh, is pretty typical of an air burst detonation. As was done in Japan in 1945. But here we'll use an 800 kiloton warhead, a relatively large bomb in today's arsenals, and a hundred times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. 800 kilotons, I think I know where he's getting that number from. I remember a while ago an article came out about Russia having, I believe the number was 700 or something, uh, warheads about 800 kilotons in size on ICBMs. I remember seeing that kind of floating around the news. I think it was during probably the earlier um, phases of the conflict with Ukraine, which of course is in full-blown war now but I remember seeing that number around, so okay, 800 kilotons. Uh, that one is kind of at the high end. He said 100 times more powerful than Hiroshima, more like 50, that one was about 14 kilotons, so, but still a pretty powerful weapon. Upon detonation, a fireball as hot as the sun would expand to a radius of 800 meters. Those near the blast would be vaporized. Yeah. And within a two kilometer radius, all buildings would likely be destroyed. And we'll assume that virtually no one survives inside this area. And again, um, that's the first part of the reaction that you see, but the actual nuclear reaction happens so much faster. The actual. Um, the device inside the bomb, all, all the reactions took place on the order of fractions of microseconds. Um, as I mentioned in my uh, reaction to Kurtzgazat, they used the term shake to describe how fast those, those reactions take place, like shakes of a rabbit's tail. But yeah, um, this sounds uh, reasonably um, accurate for about an 800 kiloton weapon. Um, I believe the one that Kurtzgazat used was a three megaton surface detonation, so an ultra rare kind of kind of situation. Which, based on population density, would start the death tally at 120,000 people. In a densely populated urban center, sure, I can. I can buy that for people who just happen to be within that two kilometer radius. As you move further away from ground zero, 
estimating depth becomes more complicated. From as far away as 11 kilometers, the radiant heat from the blast would be strong enough to cause third degree burns on exposed skin. He's referring to the thermal pulse. Um, that actually happens before the shock wave is expanding out because that light from that heat moves so much faster than the speed of sound. Um, suddenly, you're walking around and then, boom, everything, everything in that area is on fire. And as you get closer to the blast, the heat becomes so intense that clothing, even skin, would ignite into flames. Yeah. That said, most people in the city would be indoors or otherwise sheltered from direct exposure. But the very structures that offered this protection would then become a cause of injury as debris would rip through buildings and rain down on city streets. As a rough estimate, we can assume that half the people between 2 and 11 kilometers from the blast are killed. And that's not just from the fire or and the debris. So that was the 20 psi shockwave zone. Um, they're still going to be hit. They're still going to be knocked down and possibly bones broken because um, there's an other pressure ring that um, is further out. Let me show you. So right here um, is a little programmed uh, simulation called Nuke Map. Now I didn't create this. This goes through a, a gentleman by the name of Alex Wellerstein, um, and I did the same parameters he did: 800 kilotons air burst at 500 meters. Um, it seems to agree with this uh, rough, rough estimation with a fireball of about 0.8 kilometers, heavy blast of two kilometers. Um, but yeah, the, mo the other ring I was referring to is this gray one, the moderate blast damage radius. That's where you're going to have a lot of those injuries from just broken bones, people being knocked out of buildings, that sort of thing. And then you have that orange, which was that thermal pulse that we talked about earlier. But you're going to have injuries upwards of 12 kilometers out from the epicenter of this explosion. Three, smoke collapsed buildings, and radiation sickness. Which translates roughly into an additional half a million people. Many of these deaths will occur days, even weeks after the attack. Radiation sickness takes about... That number varies a lot depending on what city it is and how densely populated it is. A week to cause death. Mention of radiation sickness about a week to cause death. Um, it depends how much dose you get. So I'm going to go back to the uh, circle mop. I'm going to go back to the nuke mech model real quick. That green radius is the 500 rem radiation dose. Now that is a lethal dose in 50 to 80 percent of the population. So um, that's a that's a pretty high uh, dose. Um, now the radiation goes further outward to like about 100 rem is when you'd start to get sick, and that would extend further outward from that uh, from that radius. 500 rem, you're looking at people dying within a month. So within a week, you're you're looking at people who have gotten maybe more like a thousand rem dose. So. Don't know how what model he used into this, but half a million killed within two to eleven kilometers in a city with a population of four million, maybe. Again, depends where where exactly this is. Much of the dust and ash producing the explosion will be dangerously radioactive, especially if it originated near Ground Zero. And the distance the particles travel will depend on the wind and other factors. Now, since this simulation is of an air burst attack, it will produce significantly less radioactive fallout than ground attacks targeting missile silos or bunkers. So we'll go with a relatively small number of deaths outside the 11-kilometer range. 
So airburst, well, a lot of it would be more carried by the wind, but it would be less, and it would be kind of more dispersed through a wider range. Now, I think what he's getting at is a ground one would, would pick up more contaminated stuff on the actual ground, by all the dirt that it kicks up, as opposed to something in the air. But an airburst would actually have a wider range of fallout relative to a ground burst in terms of being spread out, but it wouldn't be as deadly. I get what he's saying, but just a bit of a clarification there. If it were a surface blast, the fallout deaths could surpass all other deaths combined, but it's a very difficult number to predict. In theory, radiate. Yeah, that depends on, again, where in the city it hit, which direction the wind was blowing, and the overall layout, urban planning of the city, and the surrounding areas, and how large the population is out in the suburbs, uh, that sort of thing, is all what this factor is. So, huge amount of uncertainty in that number. Deaths can be reduced if people can avoid exposure to the fallout, especially during the critical first few days. Fallout shelters were common during the Cold War. Talking about critical first few days, so um, that will allow opportunity for some of these short-lived radioisotopes that are released to uh, decay away. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of it can go can go away within the first few days, but there's going to be some of the more long-lived um, radioisotopes that are still going to be around. People rarely build shelters today. And schools no longer practice nuclear war drills. We generally talk less about surviving a nuclear attack. And in a way, it's good that we're less afraid of the bomb now that the Cold War is over. When nations are less on edge, the risk of accidents is arguably reduced. But nuclear weapons remain one of the great threats to humanity. And today, we're entering a new era in nuclear weapon history. Long-standing nuclear arms treaties are being reassessed, and countries, big and small, face the prospect of new arms races. In part because technologies emerging that may give one side a considerable strategic advantage, notably hypersonic weapons. So, one thing that bothers me about hy the term hypersonic. Hypersonic, all it means is weapon that travels, or not even a weapon, something that travels five times faster than the speed of sound. Hypersonic as a technology has existed during World War II in the term of like a V2 rocket could travel five times faster than the speed of sound. What they're getting at is the difference between a ballistic missile and a cruise missile that happens to be going that fast and the challenge of intercepting it. I'm going to give them a chance to talk a little bit more about it. Current nuclear missiles travel around the Earth at high altitudes, yeah. making them visible by radar earlier in their flight. Some hypersonic vehicles travel close to the Earth, through the atmosphere, at at least five times the speed of sound. Yeah, just, a, just as, I, I, as I suspected. So, um, both of these two technologies independently have been around for a long time. So, ballistic missiles um, traveling more than five times faster than the speed of sound, like I said, since during World War II. And these sort of... Um, line drive in atmosphere missiles, uh, cruise missiles, they've been around for a very long time as well. What we're seeing is the combination of those two, of those two things into a weapon that just is more challenging to intercept. Now I say more challenging, probably not impossible to do because there are weapons that can intercept missiles going that fast and there are weapons that can intercept missiles that are within the atmosphere, uh, cruise missiles kind of sneaking under the radar. So I don't think it's going to take very long to develop a countermeasure for this, and then we're kind of just back to where we were. Giving defending countries far less time to react. 
And remember that some of the most perilous moments during the Cold War occurred when countries maneuvered to reduce their opponents' reaction time. And the less time countries have to react, the more likely an accident will occur, or a rash judgment. And then you have smaller nukes that blur the line between conventional and nuclear weapons, providing a more slippery path to nuclear escalation. Referring to tactical nuclear warheads um, on the order of a few kilotons, but designed to attack um, military targets um, is where they're kind of drawing the line between, but without any of the far-reaching impacts of a strategic nuclear weapon such as the 800 kiloton device that we talked about earlier in this video. Now for ordinary citizens, nuclear weapon policy may seem like a complex, even intimidating topic. But leaders often consider public perceptions when making policy. In many countries, voter opinion is an important factor. Whether you believe nuclear weapons have made the world safer or more dangerous, both sides generally agree that the bomb brings an unparalleled risk. And what do you guys think? More safe or le less safe? Let me know down in the comments below. There are things we can do to reduce the risk, like minimizing how many countries get the bomb, or scaling back Cold War arsenals, or stabilizing technology races, or pledging to never be the first one to strike. Such ideas have often resulted in signed treaties, some of which have held for decades. Some are at risk of expiring, and some just need a final push to become activated. By being steadfast in these efforts and not walking away from diplomatic achievement, that no first use pledge is a hard one to think about when you just think about game theory. Everybody's just going to say, you first, you first, give up, but <laughs> no one's really going to do it. <laughs> we can continue the work of ensuring that this nightmare simulation never becomes a reality. Alright, well that about wraps it up. I like this video. Um, mostly pretty spot on, at least compared to that nuke map thing that I use with that seems to be reasonably accurate, and um, what do you think about the hypersonic hype? Pun intended. <laughs> I think it's a little overblown. Um, also, let me know if you think um, we should get rid of nuclear weapons or not. Um, or do you think it's going to be that same uh, you first mentality that <laughs> has been going on at least since the end of the Cold War? Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.